Well, good morning all and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. We are so delighted to have you here. Thank you for your patience and getting started just a few minutes late today. I'm going to lead us off with a special, a special message for all retired physicians from the St. Vincent Medical Staff from Woody English for the Alumni Steering Committee. Any retired physician who's been a member of the St. V's Medical Staff is welcome to be a part of this group. And this group has lunch and meetings two or three times a year to support connection and friendship. After a break during COVID, meetings have resumed, but the word is slow to get out. If you are a retired physician and have never attended, the St. Vincent Medical Staff alumni welcome you to our upcoming luncheon meeting, which will be next Wednesday, March 15th. There's no charge for the luncheon, but you must send an RSVP to Beth Morris. And this is also a reminder to medical staff alumni who have not yet sent their RSVP. Again, they should be sent to Beth Morris by tomorrow. Her email is elizabeth.morris at providence.org. So go ahead and do it right after Grand Rounds today. We also put this information into the Q&A live chat. And now on to other announcements for today. Next week, please join us for our talk, Dementia Workup, Treatment and Updates, which will be given by Dr. Nicholas Olney. And that will also be a virtual only presentation. We're here on Teams Live and you can earn CME credit for being here live virtual, or for the times that we have it live in person, or by watching a recording of the event, and that is available at the same link as the Grand Rounds invite. And now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Alejandro Perez. He is a practicing vascular medicine specialist with the Providence Heart Institute and medical director for the non-invasive vascular lab and the vascular rehabilitation program in the Portland service area. Dr. Perez is Oregon's only dedicated vascular medicine specialist and has been here with Providence since 2013. He earned his undergraduate degree from Harvard University, medical school at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, and then went on to do internal medicine internship, residency, and vascular medicine fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Dr. Perez's clinical interests include peripheral arterial disease, thrombosis management, wound care, venous disease, and vascular ultrasound. He enjoys spending time with his wife and children and is also fluent in Spanish. Dr. Perez, thank you for your generosity in teaching. We are so delighted to have you with us today. All right. Um, well, uh, it's nice to be here. So today we're going to talk about Lord Freddie's swelling, um, both uh, kind of how to recognize it, what's some of the workup, and of course, what to do about it. Often, um, encountered problem in the office. Um, we're going to talk about things that impact swelling, uh, specifically things that we may not necessarily think about as the direct cause of swelling, which is um, movement and position. Uh, well, we, we will review different types of swelling disorders uh, and maybe things that mimic swelling. Uh, and then, you know, what are the effects of uh, using some of the treatment strategies like compression uh, on and how they impact swelling? All right, so uh, moving on here. So this is kind of the model that we get taught uh, in medical school. Um, there is a drive force uh, that uh, pushes fluid out. There is a drive force that pushes uh, fluid in. Uh, this is driven by capillary pressure, interstitial protein osmotic pressure, uh, and that's what's driving things out. And then the external forces are the plasma protein osmotic pressure and interstitial pressure. So this is kind of the model we get taught as to how uh, fluid goes from the artery and then gets returned through the veins. Okay. But some problems with this model, um, uh, even though it's simplistic and it's nice to think about, it doesn't always, uh, actually it often does not uh, turn out to be uh, this simple. I mean, the reason is uh, when we think about the classic model, that's kind of an experimental based model uh, when uh, there's not external forces acted upon. Uh, so body position changes what some of that external pressure is to drive uh, fluid back in. So for example, uh, venous return uh, becomes passive when uh, limb is elevated, but venous return be, uh, slows when the limb is dependent. Uh, it also, the model does not take into account uh, muscle contraction through the calf muscles. I'll show you a little bit about that, but basically 
uh, when uh, the muscle contracts, it augments venous flow. And uh, it also doesn't take into account this other way of returning food that we have, which, is, which are the lymphatics. So we're gonna go over these things. All right, so uh, there has, uh, and I'm gonna reference the study a little bit later, but there has been MRI work to characterize what happens to the vein pressure when one stands. And so one way to, to kind of on the counter side of that is, well, how much pressure would you need to exert on a vein to compress it? And it turns out that for superficial veins, you actually need uh, in, some, in some instances up to 80 millimeters of mercury to compress that. Now, to be, to be honest, that's not something we're gonna generally put patients into, but, but this has been studied to be the force generated when the leg is dependent. And so that's why leg dependency can be a cause of swelling uh, simply by itself. It can overwhelm the return system. We talked about uh, muscle uh, contraction. So if you order a standard venous ultrasound, you're gonna notice uh, a, a standard waveform. Uh, I believe you can see my slide. Um, is that correct? You can see my uh, arrow. Not sure if you can, uh, but yes. you can see that there is a, um, a kind of a, a wave usually that's close to the baseline. And then there's another big wave uh, which here is labeled as augmented. So what happens when you do a standard venous ultrasound is one of the checks to see if there is a clot is to see if you squeeze distally, can you see an augmentation of vein flow return? And what that is a proof of is that there's no obstruction, hopefully between where you're augmenting, usually somewhere distal and to where the area that you're examining. But for our, the purposes of our discussion, it also shows that the vein flow can go more than, um, in some instances, triple, quadruple what it is normally just by squeezing the cap. And that is what someone does when they have a normal walking motion with a normal gait. So again, that classic model doesn't take that into account. So what we don't take into account is um, the, the lymphatics. And so the lymphatics are this extra system, much more difficult to characterize, that probably involves um, membrane action at the glycocalyx uh, that involves protein transport in a parallel system to the vein flow. So we still have the Starling curve uh, actors, uh, but we have this additional parallel pathway that when disrupted, can also lead to swelling. So that's why you can have normal vein flow and still have swelling if your lymphatics are disrupted. All right, so. All right, so what are the causes for swelling? So we have, um, uh, this is a short list, abbreviated list, uh, things to think about when a patient presents with that uh, complaint. Uh, so we, you know, classic of uh, sodium um, overload or retention, venous obstruction or, or insufficiency. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Arterial uh, dilatation, a low protein, capillary permeability that's abnormal, lymphatic obstruction, then heart failure, many medications. Um, I think in our practice, the most common is in the calcium channel blocker therapy, but certainly much uh, many others, cirrhosis, uh, normal uh, menstrual related edema, pregnancy related edema, and of course, someone just uh, having too much fluid. Uh, but short list, and of course, that's hopefully the history helps clarify what, uh, which of these disorders may be involved. Um, but let's say they don't come in with a uh, history already in their problem list when you first see them in the office. You do have to uh, take a little bit of a history of what else is going on. Uh, and so I try to observe my patients to see how they're walking. Do they have a limp? Do they have a history of hip surgery, knee surgery, back problems? Do they sleep in a chair? So this is getting at, are, is their calf pump intact? Are they able to uh, have normal venous return at night or their legs always dependent? And so their body cannot overcome the gravity. Um, have they had trauma to the limb? So something disrupting their vessels. Have they had a severe cellulitis episode, potentially, um, uh, affecting uh, lymphatics, uh, and uh, have they had cancer or maybe uh, just uh, disproportionate weight gain, and sometimes it can be asymmetric. And so that's what I have here. It's just kind of the things to consider uh, when you see uh, uh, 
swelling that's based on history that may be more related to position or, or prior injury. That's what we have here. All right, you, your patient told you this history. You uh, have looked at their problem list, and this is where I found, unfortunately, um, you know, virtual visits are not as helpful because sometimes you actually do need to examine the patient. Uh, and I do that to try to figure out uh, how the swelling is distributed. Does it involve the dorsum of the feet and toes? Is it actually pitting? Is it adipose tissue? And is it just a sensation they have, but it's not actually manifesting as swelling? So we'll talk a little bit about all of those. So tests that, uh, it, that can help clarify if you, if you think one diagnosis is not clear, um, uh, you're a dipstick for you know, protein, so proteinuria you're looking for, CMP, looking for kidney issues, uh, low proteins, uh, liver problems, TSH, uh, we'll talk briefly about thyroid-related swelling. Prothrombin time, again, looking for liver problems. Uh, echocardiogram, uh, of course, if a physical exam is suggestive, um, but sometimes it can be masked. Someone can have heart failure or preserved ejection fraction. Sometimes that's diagnosed this way. Uh, and then uh, vein ultrasound. So we'll talk about that. All right, so, um, so diuretics. Um, so a brief word on diuretics. Uh, certainly appropriate if we have a systemic issue. That would be CHF, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome. Those, indi those indications, typically you do start with a loop diuretic, things like cirrhosis, you may add spironolactone, and of course in the other indications as well. But be aware that there are some uh, causes of swelling that actually could be caused by the diuretic themselves, and I will give you some examples of that. So, Basically, my, my kind of uh, guidance is uh, diuretics uh, used if there's a primary medical indication for use of diuretics, but I try not to use that as the main strategy for swelling management if there is no other diagnosis that I can find. All right, so lymphedema. That's a swelling disorder that is very common in other parts of the world uh, due to filariasis. Uh, that's Bucharia bancrofti, um, but in our country, Western countries, in most of our uh, clinical experience, this will be due to some sort of disruption of lymphatics through either axillary lymph node um, uh, or inguinal lymph node dissection or removal, um, uh, and sometimes just the radiation itself. Uh, but increasingly, we're also seeing it due to obesity and just the immobility that sometimes comes as part of that. So essentially, there is uh, just the lymphatic mechanism, the way we take back this extra fluid that we were just talking about is overwhelmed, uh, either because of uh, obstruction or damage. Uh, and so you start to see lymphedema. Uh, and one of the physical exam findings that is uh, high yield for diagnosis is uh, if you cannot pinch the skin on the dorsum of the toes, that's a stemmer sign. If you get squaring of the toes um, uh, and basically uh, swelling that it goes all the way to the dorsum of the feet, uh, you start to see in more advanced stages uh, thickening of the skin at, the, at both at the cutaneous and the subcutaneous uh, level so that it, it becomes, uh, you can describe it as um, uh, kind of early elephantiasis or uh, kind of just very, uh, very hard. And it looks like they're blisters, but they're just um, skin that has been traumatized. So it has made adjustments to the chronic stress of the swelling. So that's lymphedema. Now, uh, people do ask me, well, do we do a diagnostic test for this? Well, classically, we do have uh, lymphocentigraphy, but for most patients, uh, the diagnosis will be clinical. Uh, there are some genetic tests that are available, but typically this would be, there's kind of an inheritance pattern demonstrated. So if it's before age two, uh, uh, VEGF or VEG R3, uh, if it's uh, presenting, uh, Later in life, most commonly uh, in the early 20s, uh, it's FOXC2 gene. Uh, but uh, most patients that we're seeing with lymphedema are not going to be genetic related. 
So the treatment for lymphedema is, uh, of course, if there is a secondary, if it's secondary lymphedema, you treat the primary cause first. Uh, but if, uh, regardless, once you do have the swelling and you're treating the medical cause of it, uh, if there is, uh, you need compression. Um, the gold standard for most patients, if you can make it so that, such that they can do it at, as a home-based therapy, is a type of short stretch wrap. But some patients do fine with stockings. Others need Velcro wraps instead. Uh, typically, to be effective for lymphedema, we need the higher pressures. That's 30 to 40 millimeter mercury. The, those are pressures. Uh, when you see two numbers like that, if you didn't know, the higher number is the pressure at the ankle. The, the smaller number is the pressure at the calf. Um, uh, manual lymphatic drainage, uh, there are several therapists in the Providence system that uh, in the physical therapy department who offer this um, uh, service. Um, so there's also private pay. Uh, and then there are compression pumps. Uh, one of those is shown here on the right. Uh, they've been shown to uh, help uh, along with compression garment use, uh, decrease hospitalization, decrease cellulitis. Um, this is one condition where if it's primary lymphedema, there's nothing else going on that uh, diuretics are felt to, to uh, over time probably worsen the condition uh, if that is the only reason they have swelling is just the lymphedema. But again, if you're treating heart failure, you're treating cirrhosis, you're treating something else, that, that of course is totally appropriate. Uh, patients I've... Uh, I've seen a couple uh, through the years who are requesting lymphedema surgery. Um, I would tell you that's typically done through plastic, surger, uh, plastic surgeons. Uh, it's offered as a, a first bulk reduction because there's quite a bit of fatty tissue that does develop. Uh, but it does involve what used to be called microsurgery, but now is, uh, has reached a new level where it's uh, super microsurgery. What that means is, um, for those of you who are know about other vascular disorders, so if you're talking about coronary artery like the LAD that's uh, hovering around three millimeter, the uh, superficial femoral artery, the main artery in the thigh, that's hovering around eight millimeters. Um, but we're talking about uh, vessels that are 0 0.1 millimeters in diameter. Um, so this is a, a case uh, through the Cleveland Clinic uh, where they did bulk reduction and also the micro the super microsurgery, and you know you can't say that it's normalized their leg, but you can say it significantly improved their leg, and uh, patient uh, patients generally very happy with the outcomes uh, compared to the morbidity they they had before. Um, all right, separate disorder but related in regards to uh, people present. Uh, this is lipedema. Uh, lipedema is an adipose tissue presentation uh, often concurrent with uh, obesity of some sort, typically uh, starting to be noticed at times of hormone changes like puberty, pregnancy, menopause, or when there's an addition or withdrawal of a hormone. Um, so again, suggesting an estrogen component. Classically it's stated, this is a disorder primarily affecting uh, women. Uh, I've seen quite a bit of men, it's just that they ne weren't necessarily seeking care for that. I would maybe see them for other reasons. Um, so the lipedema, the typical, the classically described symptoms that it's symmetrical, uh, there is a, um, a bracelet effect. So what, what that means is uh, you'll see a larger leg and then essentially a normal looking foot. That's kind of like the classic description of lipedema that goes from the, from the buttocks to the ankle. Uh, typically does not have pitting, so again, does require a physical exam oftentimes. Um, descriptions of persistent enlargement despite weight loss uh, and uh, people complaining of uh, painful, um, uh, being very painful to touch. Uh, bruising easily, and uh, one of the descriptors of names in the literature is adiposis dolorosus, which, which just means it's painful fat, so it does hurt for people to be squeezed in these areas, uh, and it's been described as a kind of beanie baby type texture. Now, the problem with this disorder is, unfortunately, is there's a lot of internet knowledge uh, that is not necessarily evidence-based. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, from my clinical experience, even though it's described as a uh, symmetric disorder. I have seen plenty of patients that are asymmetric. 
Uh, this typically happens if uh, someone has had a, a, a problem with movement, like a hip surgery, knee surgery, and then there was a period of weight gain. Uh, there would be an asymmetric accumulation of uh, fatty tissue. And so, the, so one leg will look larger, but it's not swollen in the classical sense. It's not fluid. Um, I have also seen it when there is uh, a, a genetic uh, abnormality or potentially a, a obstructive abnormality that develops secondary like thrombosis. But uh, the classic example I've seen is Klippel Trenani syndrome, where it's disrupted from the get go. And then um, a person reaches a puberty, there's weight gain, and then there's a disproportionate amount of adipose tissue accumulated in the limb that's affected uh, with the obstruction. Uh, patients often have cutaneous venous congestion. What that means is um, there will be like a plethora to their skin. Uh, and then it, one way to just, you know, to, to demonstrate this is if they, you elevate the limb and then massage it, uh, it will improve um, back to their normal baseline color. Um, some patients particularly salt sensitive, uh, so they do get actual uh, uh, weight, uh, uh, water weight retention uh, that's kind of dynamic throughout the day, uh, but uh, that's not the, probably the most common presentation. Uh, again, the, the internet has many um, uh, guidances uh, using uh, vibration plates, uh, trampolines, uh, antioxidants, uh, the, there is some consensus around what helps just about everybody. So dietary management, um, it, it is often presenting along with obesity. So that's still kind of a focus of when I do a consultation. Um, compression therapy does help many people, especially because there's often a venous abnormality that's concurrent. So I always check for venous reflux. Um, we do, I do discuss that they may wish to seek consideration for bariatric surgery. Obviously, there are now medicines that are uh, SDLT, uh, SDLP2 one inhibitors. Uh, uh, that you know, there are basically better medications than there used to be for management of weight. Uh, and this is a useful resource, very common sense approach to how to approach lipedema. It does uh, get at some of the, the kind of folklore around lipedema. Uh, I think uh, it's a useful resource that I share with my patients uh, if you want to save it for later reference. All right, idiopathic edema. So uh, this is kind of diffuse edema, but sometimes the leg is the most uh, common presentation. Uh, typical presentation is premenopausal woman without other uh, abnormal medical problems that is identified, uh, such as cardiac, hepatic, kidney, that would typically be causing swelling, but can be seen with diabetes. It has been associated with purging behaviors. People question whether then that means, you know, maybe that's that's the primary source of the problem. The proposed mechanism is capillary leak. Uh, so just uh, so it's kind of kind of a POTS type scenario. They when they become their legs are dependent, their fluid just pools. Um, uh, refeeding syndrome, again, when people have uh, done queries as, as to dietary histories, the, the feeling is if someone is basically based, uh, not eating uh, sufficient, sufficient for their needs, that when they do eat, there's kind of, there is a refeeding type syndrome, so swelling is a part of that. And, um, and then if there has been a long-term use of diuretics, that can actually be part of the problem. Uh, as far as how the, the diuretic uh, mechanism works is, so there is a medication induced hypovolemia. So you activate sodium retaining mechanisms, uh, specifically renin angiotensin. And then if you stop the diuretic, um, then they become dependent on that. And so then there's a rebound edema. And of course, in their mind, you've proven, see, I told you I need the diuretic, but if you counsel ahead of time, no, I, I say, you know, I think this may be what is going on. It's a diagnosis of exclusion, but uh, you need to usually give it about three weeks. And then usually there is spontaneous diuresis that can resume. Um, uh, but they should probably follow um, a low sodium diet because of this uh, going forward. So again, just another consideration of uh, the, the typical the typical situation is uh, it's like a creep of medication. Someone has mild ankle swelling, they get put on a diuretic, they see some benefit, they go on a trip, they're using more swelling, the diuretic keeps getting increased and increased, and then it, it becomes um, a situation where the, 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 they, they keep taking the medication and you keep increasing the doses, and, and this could be the primary culprit 
I, I kind of look at it the way uh, you, you can get NSAID related headaches that sometimes you, you have to shut it off in order to actually treat the problem uh, that you were treating in the first place. Uh, all right. Uh, this is a, a disorder I have not personally uh, treated, uh, but of course we know about it from the literature, and I'm sure some of you out there have seen it, which is uh, swelling related to Graves uh, disease. Uh, it's uh, it's glycosaminoglycans in the dermis, um, but uh, even though it's classically described in the pretibial areas, it can also affect the uh, foot and ankle. And so, uh, yeah, the pretibial areas is 99%, but you could see it in other places too. The treatment is, in addition to the treating the thyroid uh, problem, uh, topical steroids, and sometimes um, it's, uh, it's also injected as well. All right, so uh, venous disorders, uh, that's, you know, kind of this is definitely, you know, something I see all day long. Um, and that can lead to swelling, of course. It has many mechanisms. It could be from prior clotting. It could be from uh, venous compression. That's main Thurner syndrome, where the iliac artery uh, pushes on the iliac vein, most commonly the left side. Uh, it can be from vein incompetence. Uh, gold standard, of course, is ven venography, which is uh, what, you know, I'm showing you a picture of here. but uh, probably that's not going to be done for most patients. The most common study that's done for most patients is uh, a vein reflux study. Uh, and this is just a call out uh, that this is different from uh, a rule out DVT type study. It's a different protocol. Uh, I will uh, guide uh, that if you think your patient has chronic venous insufficiency, certainly order it. Uh, it's uh, in the Providence system that's uh, it, you order a VAS venous reflux, but this is not something that's appropriate for inpatient testing. Uh, the patient does have to ideally stand for part of the exam, uh, but if somebody has chronic swelling, um, this is part of this would be a reasonable workup. If someone has acute swelling, well, I think you do have to rule out a DVT. Uh, and and by the way, they will comment on a DVT if, they, if you order a vein reflux study, but. Uh, because it takes more time. Um, if you need something urgent, it would be a, a rule out um, DVT standard venous ultrasound study. Uh, I also uh, sometimes, if I have a consideration for May Thurner syndrome, will order an iliac vein ultrasound uh, to clarify if there's uh, abnormal size of the um, iliac veins of one side to the other, especially if there is an asymmetry in the swelling. Uh, you can order an MR and CT with venous contrast. The problem with these studies, it's very difficult to time the phase of the vein contrast. The, the, the protocols are much more set up to uh, evaluate well the ar arterial phase. Uh, so I'm, I just, I just want to warn you, even if you put clear messaging to the radiology team, uh, sometimes you still on a uh, MR or CT study you still may not get the, the phase right in the area you're trying to investigate. Um, and then there's venography. Venography is the gold standard now for uh, uh, trying to diagnose uh, May Thurner syndrome because sometimes it does require intravascular ultrasound to um, kind of take a 360 view uh, inside the lumen of the blood vessel. Um, this is uh, just a little uh, uh, imaging 101. If any of you want to do uh, more than just look at your reports, you actually want to see your images. Uh, you'll see that on uh, vein uh, imaging, you'll see sometimes this, uh, this uh, sinusoidal uh, wave pattern, and that's because of the respiratory uh, variation. So we call that respirophasic. Uh, and it essentially means that when your uh, diaphragm is uh, low, uh, so you're uh, taking a, a deep breath, uh, the, it actually slightly decreases uh, the, the vein flow. And then when you exhale, uh, your abdominal pressure releases, and uh, and so there's a little bit more augmentation of flow, and that's normal. That's what we expect to see. Um, sometimes you're going to see patterns where it's a, a more pulsatile, so uh, the one on the uh, top here and the one that's regurgitant, those are starting to suggest that there is a cardiac uh, uh, disorder, but maybe uh, regurgitation, maybe just central venous pressure is elevated. Uh, the respiratory phasic uh, is an important distinction to make from this waveform right here, which is continuous. That's when you would uh, suspect that there is an upstream um, 
uh, obstruction. So if you ever uh, look at your vein ultrasounds, you will notice that if you only order it for one leg, let's say the left, you will see a comment of the contralateral, so the right common femoral vein evaluated. And that's because uh, they're trying to show that there isn't something more upstream. If the two patterns in both common femoral veins are the same, then that tells you that there's likely um, no what there isn't something just uh, upstream of the site you're interested in. But if the pattern of uh, a flow in your uh, leg that you were not interested in looks like this, but the leg you're interested in looks has this monophasic pattern um, with just continuous, then uh, that that warrants potentially a more evaluation. Ideally, if um, uh, the reader uh, or the tech who's doing the study would call this out uh, if there was a need for further investigation. Uh, so the vein reflux study, what they're looking for is, is the is the flow pattern always in the same direction from the foot to the head? And by convention, in most vascular labs, at least ours, you can visualize when you see a flow pattern, the head being on the left of the screen and the foot being on the right of the screen. So the flow should go uh, towards towards the foot, so from right to left. And so when you capture this on an ultrasound, uh, the way they angle it, they uh, will capture the normal vein flow to be uh, underneath the line. You can switch the axes and make it look like however you want, but by convention, we typically put normal vein flow on the bottom of the line. By, again, it's just a convention for ease of visualization. And then abnormal vein flow, which we call reflux, is in uh, on the top of the axis. And uh, depending on which laboratory, uh, just by consensus guidelines, usually if, if you're above a second, that's everybody agrees that's reflux. Depending on a surgical literature, uh, 500 milliseconds in a superficial vein may be enough to call it, and uh, 350 milliseconds in a perforating vein is enough to call it. And if you were just unfamiliar with looking at these uh, images, uh, every tick mark on the bottom is 0.2 seconds. So five of them is a second. All right, many of your patients need compression. Many of your patients cannot put on compression or they tell you they cannot because of, uh, they can't bend over, they don't have the hand strength, um, but they don't know how. And so there are tools, uh, This the, the one in the, on the left is a Donning Butler, the one in the middle is called the Dauphin Donner. Uh, th these are basically two tools that help you turn the sock inside out and then help you uh, roll it onto the foot. And then some patients do need donning gloves. There's different manufacturers. Uh, Garden gloves may do just fine. Basically, just gives you a little bit more grip, helps you smooth out the stocking. Uh, so the reason why stockings uh, help has to do with what is happening on the inside of your muscle versus what is happening on the outside. Uh, so uh, this is the study I was referencing earlier where uh, MRI pictures were done while someone was standing and they had them um, uh, use no compression and then use compression. And um, it, it's a little grainy here. I, I have a better picture coming up, but basically the deep veins compress pretty well at what we consider a moderate strength compression, uh, 22 millimeter HG in this example. But the varicose veins do not change much. Okay, I showed you the picture of how many, how much it took uh, to squeeze some of those varicose veins, again, upwards of uh, 60, 70, 80 millimeters of mercury. Uh, but when you're just using the moderate compression, uh, you're really mainly squeezing the deep veins. So here you're getting about 70% uh, percent compression with that moderate compression. And then the superficial veins, uh, like the varicose veins, only uh, here less than 10% were compressed. So, you know, when I first presented this at a nursing conference, I almost had a revolution in the room. Like, how can you, what do you mean it works better for deep, not superficial? The superficial or smaller? It, it does have to do with location. So this is basically what's happening. The deep veins uh, are in the muscle. So there's a resting pressure in the muscle that is augmented by the external compression, okay? Whereas, so people have put pressure probes to actually measure this. I think I have another presentation where you can see a cadaver version of how they did this. But, but um, 
So when somebody uh, adds external compression, this internal um, chamber is getting both the resting pressure, in this case, uh, they measured uh, average 34 millimeter mercury, and then also the external pressure, so 56. Whereas those that are on the superficial aspect, these varicose veins, really are only getting that external pressure. So, so, that, so basically, they don't, the only help they get is from the skin. And to some extent, that's why I, you know, I, you'll see most half my console probably I talk about compression because we want to preserve that skin elasticity. Whatever help their skin can give them, we want to preserve it. Um, because once it's been stretched one too many times, the elasticity may just not recover. And that's what we're trying to preserve. So if you're going to, uh, you know, I see many uh, a patient tell me that somebody told them to get compression, but they didn't give any further guidance, uh, you know, maybe mild or moderate, but not an actual number. So these are kind of standard uh, guidelines as to what uh, class one, class two, class three, class four, but you can just put the numbers. Uh, so light grade compression uh, is typically eight to 15 or 15 to 20. Uh, moderate, uh, which is what it would take if somebody has documented venous insufficiency. It's what insurance companies are looking for if they're wanting to authorize for vein interventions later is at least 20 to 30 millimeter mercury. And then if uh, somebody has lymphedema or more severe varicosities or they've had a DVT, we typically uh, try to advocate for stronger compression, 30 to 40. Uh, and then uh, some patients you need even stronger. But again, we're probably the, the, the workhorse for clinical swelling is gonna be the 20 to 30, uh, just because of the practicalities of what people can actually put on. Uh, other benefits of compression, so I just talked about the veins. Uh, uh, so this is a little study, 12 patients, to look at the lymphatics at what happens with compression, uh, just to see you know, what, what effect it has. It's more qualitative, but uh, this is a patient with a venous ulcer and uh, kind of before and after uh, on the top and then before and after on the bottom. And that's when you can see uh, the lymphatics actually do uh, play some role in, um, in what's pooling in their limb and it could be affecting their healing. So, so many patients uh, may benefit from lymphatic management as part of their venous management, which is why uh, this, these types of compression pumps have as an indication uh, that you can use them for venous ulcers if the venous ulcers have not healed in six months. So that is a, an additional indication for those pumps other than just lymphedema. So word about um, uh, insurance. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, insurance uh, does play some role here. Not everything gets covered. If somebody has compression, um, a prescription, and they have a wound, uh, that often can get covered through um, if they're a Medicare patient, some commercial insurance. Uh, compression pumps typically get authorized if you have congenital lymphedema, if you have uh, uh, proven lymph node uh, uh, damage or removal, or if you have those vein ulcers that have been present for greater than six months. Uh, but more and more, uh, Medicare has at least uh, eased up on some of the restrictions, so some patients can get these pumps just by showing that they've tried to use compression for at least 30 days, even if they don't have these classic reasons. Uh, venous disease medications. Um, I don't typically use them, but I do provide them as an adjunct of uh, treatment. Uh, this is Portland. People do appreciate uh, natural options. A uh, horse chestnut seed extract is one. Diosmin is another. Butcher's broom is another. Um, uh, so this is just one example of horse chestnut seed extract uh, helping in a randomized trial to reduce uh, uh, leg volume. So again, some clinical benefit. Uh, all of these are gonna probably be low quality, lower quality studies. There are interventional treatments for veins. That's why there are vein clinics. Uh, the typical indications for treatment uh, from a medical perspective is pain, swelling, venous ulcer, either prevention or recurrence. They do heal faster. Uh, they do uh, have less chance of coming back if the veins are intervened upon. Um, there are different strategy types. Uh, our, you know, forefathers generations, it was vein ligation, so that's mechanical, the one at the bottom. Uh, more commonly now is probably the thermal ablations, uh, uh, either laser or real frequency. 
but there are also chemical ablations available, uh, foam sclerotherapy, hypertonic saline, um, and then uh, newer on the market is uh, cyanoacrylate embolization. It's a type of glue, uh, doesn't require heat. And uh, when you compare these, most of these that uh, are have pretty good um, uh, uh, success rates. Uh, the newer ones uh, have less data, but still uh, good promising results. Probably the workhorse of treatment in the community is going to be uh, some sort of uh, thermal ablation that will be either radio frequency or laser. So just be aware if you refer patients to a vein clinic, that's probably going to be the main therapy. We have just a few slides here because uh, I want to make sure I have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, so basically swelling is something you can identify based upon position, movement, and hopefully you rolled out other medical disorders. Consider using diuretics if needed, but often compression is a workhorse strategy. Advanced strategies are available. Then I'm going to just show three slides. I won't talk about it much. It's more a picture is that occasionally I get these uh, consults for foot discoloration. There can be swelling. This is I turned it acrocyanosis. I presented this uh, last uh, two years ago. Uh, if you ever have a patient with purple feet and a little bit of swelling and you massage them and it goes away, okay, that's probably what this is. It's just a venous discoloration. People are more and more looking at their feet because of COVID. Uh, there may be other disorders going on, but this is one simple uh, kind of in office exam you could do to show them that it's actually not Raynaud's and uh, no, they're not going to lose their feet. It's more uh, venous congestion. So I'll go back here. All right, that's it. I want to make sure I, I have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, I know we started late, uh, but I want to make sure that we have uh, a little bit of time. So I, I have any questions there, uh, Laura, I'm happy to field. Yeah, them. great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez. Um, a few questions starting to filter in here. Uh, two related questions um, calling out um, whether we need to have any concern for safety of compression in in the face of peripheral arterial disease. Ah, so for example, sure. if it seems like um, typical venous insufficiency, do we need ABIs first? Any comments in general on this topic? Uh, yes, so I think if someone is going to be doing compression for the wound in a wound setting, you would do ABIs regardless because you need to also rule out arterial insufficiency. That's a separate talk. Happy to give that. Uh, uh, it, as, as a uh, kind of ballpark, if uh, I, I use uh, clinical history. So if somebody has bounding pulses, uh, my first thoughts are not to get ABIs if they, uh, if they need compression for edema. But if I cannot feel the pulses, and I usually have a handheld Doppler, and I cannot appreciate a strong, at least biphasic signal. Yeah, I'm getting ABIs, and we and we leave it, we table it, and we say let's start with something light, like tuba grip, or just over the counter, over the calf tube socks, and then once we get the studies done, we do the uh, medical grade. So that is a good question. Generally, ABIs. If there is any question of arterial insufficiency. Uh, in a standard adult, that would be age over 65 um, with no other risk factors, or uh, if they're over age 50 and they have strong risk factors for peripheral disease like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Thanks so much. And just in follow up, um, if some degree of peripheral arterial disease is found but not severe enough to be intervened upon, is there a level of compression that is still safe? I'm sorry, if, if some amount of arterial disease is found? Right. Yeah. 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 So uh, depending on uh, the manufacturer, um, so some compression wraps will actually put an EBI guidance. Uh, so wound clinics are familiar with this. But this is why an ABI is useful because you can request digital pressures to be taken as part of the API. Uh, um, and those digital pressures tell you how, you know, what pressure did it take to block the artery flow? So I use that very commonly to be able to guide myself as to what compression can I safely use. I usually, I try to say 20 millimeters of mercury below what the what the uh, recorded digital pressure is. So if they have a digital pressure of, uh, you know, 50 millimeters of mercury, usually you can safely use from an arterial perspective, 30 millimeters of mercury compression. Uh, 
So that's how you can use those non-invasive tests to help guide what would be safe, even if they do have some element of arterial disease. That's, so that's, that's how you can use those tests uh, to your benefit to, to guide. Now, patients still may have difficulty putting on those documents, but that's not, that's different from is it safe? Great, thank you so much. Um, I have another question here. I think you partially addressed the answer in your discussion of diuretic use for idiopathic edema, but this specific question is, can you briefly review the reason that diuretics worsen lymphedema? Yeah, so essentially what you're, when you diurese, uh, you're, you're generally removing the intravascular volume, okay? So there, so you're you're decreasing the the pressure that's in the blood vessel, uh, which is good if there is a fluid overload situation, uh, could worsen cardiac output. We have a tolerance for that, but the the net result is that you will end up concentrating the protein component in the tissue. And so there will still be there will be still a net draw of fluid back into the 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 soft tissue. So just so you know, I I, I probably just like I would tell you if I had to characterize the average primary care practice, there's probably uh, uh, a hair trigger to start the diuretic. If I were to characterize my practice, I'm probably like too slow to start a diuretic because of these concerns. Like I want to do everything else before I do a, a diuretic. And so uh, there's probably a, 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 a happy medium. I will tell you my personal feeling on the matter is even though lymphedema is specifically cautioned against for um, uh, using diuretic strategies, Again, most of these data were generated kind of in a classic laboratory setting, which does not take into account, uh, account again, the calf pump doesn't take into account leg dependency. And increasingly, potentially some of these did not take into account this uh, related, uh, not related, but a, a separate cardiac disorder, which is the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Many of us are, you know, will order these tasks. And before we had an appreciation for how severe these things could be, if you saw a preserved ejection fraction, you, you would, or a no valvular disease, you would tell your patient, it looks like there's no heart failure, it looks fine, but yet their RBSP would be like 60 or 70. And so maybe they would still benefit from diuretic strategy. And so um, I would say I don't, I don't use it as an absolute no for diuretics in uh, lymphedema, but I definitely look to optimize everything else first before I go to diuretics. Great, thank you. That's extremely helpful. And perhaps I can squeeze in one last pragmatic question. Thank you for getting us in the ballpark of the number of millimeters of mercury to prescribe. Any further tips, or maybe you even have epic smart phrases for helping the patient actually operationalize getting the stockings, having them properly fitted? Any last parting thoughts there? Yes, so the, my guidance is it, the, there are two ways. It, it, when I first started into practice, the only way you could get a good pair of medical grade compression stockings was a medical supply store. Now you can get anything you want through the internet. And so th this is the caveat. Okay, the internet will always be cheaper. Okay, but depending on the where they are obtained, the fit may not be right. Uh, so uh, so if you're looking for uh, uh, the best fit still is through a medical supply store where somebody actually measures the ankle and calf, usually in the morning. Uh, usually they require an appointment uh, to, to have the most proper fit. If somebody, because of cost or because it's difficult for, to leave their home, wants to do this on them for themselves, what they do is they take a measuring tape and they uh, uh, that, that can, that's flexible, they put it around their ankle or they put a piece of string and they put it around the ankle and then put that on a ruler and measure their ankle at the narrowest point, just above the ankle bone, uh, and their calf at its widest point, uh, mid-calf. And then some, some will ask for uh, the distance uh, of one inch below the knee. Basically, where do you want the stocking to end? You don't want it to end at the crease behind the knee, at the popliteal fossa. You want it to be just below the bend of the knee. And many manufacturers now 
Well, with those measurements, my wife did this for me for Christmas. Get on the bed, hun, here's a measuring tape. Give me your measurements and well, that's your Christmas present. Uh, you can order these yourself, but you need those measurements. Ankle, calf, and le length of the leg or where you want it to end. And that, and for many manufacturers now, that is available. So if somebody wants a good fit, then they usually need to go to a website that asks them for those measurements. Perfect. Thank you. On that very practical note, we are just at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez. All right. Thank you. And I'm sorry for delay, everybody, but we got there. <laughs>